All attendees are in listen only mode. And good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy and session 17 of the Morgoth's Ring class. Already way longer than we expected the class to be, but that's okay. Uh, glad to be with you guys, especially glad to be with you guys, uh, taking our class especially not for granted this evening. Uh, uh, we just had the Tropical Storm come through, Tropical Storm Isaiah's here, and uh, I my house here was out of power for uh, about 16 hours total. And um, uh, it was, uh, so I didn't, I wasn't able to do class last night because we, we, power was going in and out during class until it went out for good, uh, in the latter, what would have been the latter part of class. Uh, and I was starting to get worried. I was like, well, at least there's plenty of time for them to restore power before the Mythgard Academy. And then as we rolled into the afternoon here today, I was getting a little edgy, but, uh, yeah. And no, Mary, we did not get to see a tornado. Uh, my son was disappointed, but, um, uh, but uh, yeah, he's always wanted to see a tornado, but we never have yet. Um, we just we don't live in the right place uh, for them. It was one of his greatest disappointments, actually, when we moved to New England, uh, because he knew that his chances of seeing a tornado were only decreasing uh, as um, we moved up here. But anyway, all was well. All is uh, all's uh, all's fine now. I agree. Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Chris, uh, uh, anxiety was intense. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, um, here we are back. So tonight, first of all, apologies for being later than usual tonight. Uh, but I have an excuse. Uh, my excuse was I was kind of, you know, hanging out with Rowan Flieger earlier this evening. Um, as most of you know, Myth Moot is happening this week. Um, we're starting tomorrow, indeed, uh, is Myth Moot, uh, and extending through the rest of the weekend. Really, really excited about Myth Moot festivities, and we were preparing for one. Uh, we were doing... Um, so, uh, Verlin Flieger has published a, a new book called Arthurian Voices, and one of the things that is contained in this wonderful book uh, is a play that she's written, a modern play adaptation, um, a comedy adaptation of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Uh, she does the whole story, basically, of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight uh, in play form. Uh, and we're going to be doing the f premiere performance. We're going to do a Reader's Theater performance uh, of uh, her play. And so I was just, uh, I'm in the play. I get to be the Green Knight in the play. Uh, so I'm, um, uh, we just had a rehearsal all evening. Um, and our rehearsal went a little bit late and I'm like, Oh, I've got class starting like, a, you know, 10 minutes ago. Uh, but it was, I mean, Hey, she had like final directives and stuff, uh, you know, for how we should be delivering our lines and everything. So, you know, like when Verlin Flieger talks, you listen. So there I was, um, anyway, so it's, uh, really exciting. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm delighted, uh, by the, uh, by the play. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I really enjoy my parts. Um, no, Cecilia, I'm not, in fact, going to be dyeing myself green. Um, I don't have enough green paint. Uh, and of course, I'd have to take it off for part of the play, which would be certainly beyond my own technical capabilities. So uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> so that's why I'm late. That's, that's my excuse. And obviously also uh, segues into my announcement for this week, which is just to remember Myth Moot starting tomorrow. Um, we have a lot of people signed up. We are, I don't know what the numbers are right now, but we, we have something like 130 to 140 people uh, signed up in Moot Hub, and then another um, at least 50, 60 signed up for... Um, uh, for Mootcast as well. Um, so we're going to have a lot of people participating uh, in uh, in MythMoot this year. It's going to be a lot of fun. We've already begun uh, sort of chatting and talking and kind of pre-gaming for MythMoot uh, on our uh, social channels that we've set up. Uh, and I am uh, I'm really excited to see how this goes. This is going to be a really fun uh, experiment. So um, uh, I 
urge you, if you haven't signed up yet, to consider doing so. Um, and again, just to make sure everybody knows the difference between them, Moot Hub is basically for people who are able to really be a part of the event in real time. Uh, Moot Hub not only gives you access to all the talks uh, and all of the presentations and stuff, but it also gives you uh, access to sort of social channels and other informal events that are happening and extra opportunities to hang out with and ask questions of the of the presenters and things like that. Um, uh, I'm going to be hanging out on Moot Hub channels all weekend long, doing private chats with people and stuff. I, I, I'm really excited. Um, but then, of course, there is for people who can't really kind of be a part of it in real time, uh, there's Mootcast. And so Mootcast enables you to, you can come in live to the actual sessions, like the paper sessions and the, the talks and the major presentations. You can hear Varone's play. Um, but... Um, uh, but but it's it, it it doesn't it doesn't have the full like live conference experience. It's primarily designed for people who can maybe only catch one or two things live, but then will get access to the archived recording. So if you don't if you can't really be there, you know, all day for the whole weekend, but you want to still be able to, um, you know, to enjoy the presentations, Mootcast is definitely the way to go uh, there. So. Yeah. Yeah. Francis, it has been really cool to see lots of new people coming to Myth Moot. We've had a lot of new folks uh, coming in this year, uh, and that has been uh, really excited. Francis, I saw you uh, uh, were logged in pretty early there. Uh, good to see you uh, in our in our uh, Myth Moot chat rooms there, too. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah, I know. Brianna says, finally a myth moot that doesn't involve airfare for me to attend, but it's during a week when I'm super busy with work. I See, I know. These things happen sometimes. But, Brianna, that's exactly why we have the mootcast option for folks. You know, if you if you can't make it live the whole time, you can still get access to it. You only have access to that. Um, um, you only have access to it. Like, basically, you, you can only sign up for it. If you sign up, you have access to the stuff indefinitely, but um, if you, but you have to sign up before the end of the conference. So like once the conference is over, you know, this is not something we're going to be like selling access to for years to come. It's, it's an event, right? Um, so you have to sign up for Mootcast before the end of the event. Moot Hub, you really need to, again, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a live event. So you want to make sure that you get in on that uh, near the beginning, but you can still sign up for it. Registration still open now, still will be open tomorrow. So uh, you can still, you can still jump in on that. Um, all right. So I, I just, I, again, really excited. I know many of you, several of you who are here tonight are going to be giving presentations, really looking forward to that. Um, my favorite thing about Mootcast, which we started last year, um, because of course the, everyone who signs up for Moot Hub also gets access to all the archived recordings and stuff. And I'm sure many of you can relate to this when you go to a really fun conference and there's like three concurrent sessions going on and you wish you could be in all three rooms, but you have to choose one and it's cruel difficult to choose uh, which panel to be in. Um, uh, or like in my case, when I often like, uh, I was just noticing this. I was, I was looking at the schedule and I'm like, oh man, that one's going to be really, really hard to choose because they're like all three of those I really, really want to go to. And then I found I was assigned to moderate one of them. And I'm like, well, that makes my choice of which one I'm going to go to, but now I'm going to have to miss the other two. But then I remembered uh, finally, Moodcast is a thing. We started that last year, continuing it this year, so we will have the archived recordings for everybody to be able to uh, to tune in later and to go back and, and catch up on the things uh, that you missed. So that's uh, uh, and again, that, and that's for everybody who signs up uh, for for uh, for either of our two registration levels. All right, oh, and I have my uh, my my product placement. This is my, this is my official myth moot, uh, 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 merch here. I got my, I, I, I got my official cup here to celebrate myth moot week. Uh, uh, pretty fun. All right. right this huge mosquito right in front of my face. Okay. Um, <laughs> me going in and out of my house all day today, trying to get my generator working. All right. Let us get back to the text because, um, I have an ambition tonight. I have a dream and my dream is to finish the later Quenta material so that after Mythmoot, we are all ready to jump in to the Athrobeth. That is my goal for tonight. And we'll see 
how we do. So we have just a few things left. We we finished all of the uh, Finway and Muriel passages. We have a few philosophical, few last philosophical speculations spawned by that. And then we're going to move on uh, to the later narrative uh, and look at the, the sort of the evolution of the Quenta. Coming back in the end, if I'm very fortunate and I get to my last slide, to Christopher Tolkien's discussion of the way in which the narrative was clearly beginning to change. That is the format of what is this thing called the Silmarillion uh, that he was working on and thinking about. Um, okay, so let's jump back in. And the Valar were greatly concerned to see that all their labor for the guarding of Valinor was of no avail, to keep out evil and the shadow of Melkor, if anything, living or unliving, was brought thither out of Middle-earth and left free or unguarded. And they perceived at last how great was the power of Melkor in Arda, in the making of which it was his part, in the making of which, as it was his part, was such that all things, save an Amon alone, had an inclination to evil and to perversion from their right forms and courses. Wherefore, those whose being began in Arda, and who moreover were by nature a union of spirit and body, drawing the sustenance of the latter from Arda Mard, must ever be in some degree liable to grief, to do or to suffer things unnatural, and though dwelling in Amman might be a guard against this evil, it was not a full cure, unless in long ages. Okay, um, so this is... Um, uh, this is, oh, and I, I apologize. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to actually put my slides up on the screen for most of you. There you go. Sorry, sorry, there it is. Okay, um, <clears throat> all right. So, uh, sorry, folks on Twitch could see that. Uh, uh, I could see that, sorry. All right, so um, the this is this is nothing new, right? What we have here is, so the, the primary things that we're noticing in these latter stages of the revision of this text, of the larger Finway and Muriel text, is Tolkien taking the ideas that he was working through. We saw him kind of brainstorming the ideas, developing those ideas, or sort of allowing those, um, uh, the <laughs> good grief, <laughs> I'm being like photobombed by insects now. Um, come on, moth. Okay, so, <laughs> sorry, it's a moth. I think it has a message for me. Uh, is Gandalf in danger? I don't know. Um, but um, anyway, okay. <laughs> sorry, what a weird night. In these later stages of the text, he is taking all those ideas that we're developing, that we saw him developing, and he's integrating them into the narrative. We saw, for instance, you'll remember, um, in the final, in the latest version... I won't say final because it's not the version that made it into the published text, but in the latest version uh, of the, the, the Quenta narrative about Finway and Muriel, remember he incorporated the speech from Vaire about, um, about her opinion about Muriel's heart, right? Um, and how hard it was and how she was not going to change her mind, even though, of course, she does afterwards, right? Vaire turns out to be wrong about that. So you remember that was in the debate. And Tolkien has extracted that from the debate, and he's placed it now within the narrative itself. It's one of the, it's one of the, uh, only a very few direct elements of text from that debate of the Valar that gets incorporated directly into the Quentin narrative as he revises it. Here we see some of the ideas, not quotes exactly, but some of the ideas, especially Yavanna's idea about the significance of Arda Mard, right, and in particular the fact that. The children of Iluvatar, even though their spirits, their fear, may come straight from Iluvatar, their bodies are of the matter of Arda, and Arda has been marred, and so therefore um, they are naturally. And the way that he expresses it here is more forcefully, I think, more directly than we saw him do later on. I mean, he's he's. I think we're we're seeing this kind of digested and. Um, stated more clearly, more firmly, more, I don't want to say absolutely, that's a dangerous word perhaps, but um, uh, but um, uh, certainly a uh, uh, more forceful statement. And that is uh, everything, right? Uh, uh, all things, save an Amon alone, had an inclination to evil and to perversion from their right forms and courses. All of the stuff of Arda has an inclination to evil 
and to perversion from their right forms, to be twisted out of their right forms and courses. Everything has that inclination to evil, right? And again, we saw that idea being kicked around, and now we see it being basically placed into the narrative, right? Put into the mouth of the narrator here in a fairly authoritative sounding way, right? Not just one voice in the debate, you know, Yovana's voice as it was, um, but um, uh, but we're seeing that worked through now very explicitly in the text. And of course, it's not just, you know, there's this question, there's still a kind of, um, I mean, the subject of this passage, right, from the beginning is the Valar's relationship to this. They're only just figuring this out. They didn't realize how great was the power of Melkor and Arda. They didn't realize that Melkor's marring was so perver- so pervasive, uh, perverting as well, but so pervasive throughout Arda, such that everything now has this inclination to evil and perversion. Um, save in Amon alone, right? Except not, in fact, right? Um, and though dwelling in Amon might be a guard against this evil, it was not a full cure unless in long ages, maybe, maybe, after a long period of time, the other Valar, all the other Valar, their present might uh, enable, uh, you know, might sort of prevail to uh, suppress or alter that inclination to evil. Um, but as we see, they are learning, the Valar are learning um, a hard lesson here, right? A hard lesson that not only is the world much more thoroughly marred by Melkor than they thought, but Amon is not as immune to it as they hoped. And again, this is one of the things, this is one of the conclusions drawn from the Muriel and Finway situation that Tolkien is now in this la- latter version um, embedding in the narrative itself, right? It's one of the things that he's choosing as a, a real kind of take home uh, from this. Um, uh, and yeah, yeah, Chris, you're right. The Valar is uh, the, the viewpoint has become more more author, more authoritative in that <clears throat> it speaks collectively here of the Valar, not of like the opinion of one of the Valar, which might be opposed by others, right? I, I, I agree. Taking it out of the context of the debate and putting it in this context does have that effect, I agree. And Tony points out that this is similar to what he did, what Tolkien did in The Lord of the Rings, when he drafted things more explicitly, but in the final version became more, uh, more implicit. It is true, he doesn't, when he's doing the, the kind of the first drafting, right? When he's sort of discovering things, he tends to kind of, spell things all out, right? Kind of step by step, especially. And then often he will kind of roll it back and be more elusive, not necessarily more indirect, but he'll say less, essentially. He'll, he'll sort of convey it. He certainly will tend to make it pithier and sometimes less on the nose, less explicit, less direct. Here he is quite direct, I think. Um, uh, but it is certainly much more, um, much more compressed, uh, than it was in the earlier version. So it's interesting to see the way that he is kind of putting this into a mature narrative, which, of course, Christopher did not include uh, in the published Silmarillion. Um, all of this stuff, I mean, almost all of the later materials, we've read the final text. I mean, we've already seen the the, the, the text which makes the published Silmarillion um, from almost this whole section. We've already seen it. It's an earlier version. Um, this later stuff, after he wrote The Laws and Customs, after he wrote The Debate of the Valar, and he's working this through. Um, just like the later versions that we're going to see of The Darkening of Valinor uh, and, you know, Ungoliant and Melkor, uh, the later stuff with Feanor uh, and Mithros and others like that, and Finway, that also doesn't make the published Silmarillion. He, Christopher, is going to choose to use the material from the annals instead, which we've already read uh, pretty much. So, um, and again, Christopher doesn't um, say as much about why exactly he made that choice. He doesn't explain what is it about this material exactly that uh, led him to leave it out. Um, With this stuff, 
you know, it's not shocking to me in this passage. I mean, I can certainly imagine, I'm only guessing here, but I can certainly imagine that this is still, this is a pretty big can of worms, philosophically speaking. Um, and I'm not, and it would involve, in order to be, to have the whole of the Silmarillion story be consistent with this, it's likely going to have domino effects in other parts of the narrative, which are not necessarily um, going to be things that Christopher has material to work with. So he either has to do this and leave the other stuff inconsistent, or he has to put in this and make up other stuff, right? And alter other things on his own, or he has to leave this out. And clearly he chose the latter of those three options. All right. Uh, But speaking about, uh, so you'll remember that we were talking a little while before, uh, several classes back, about the fall of Adam and original sin and questions like that. And we we're talking about how how is this concept of Artemard that he is describing, how does this relate with traditional Christian doctrines of the fall of Adam and everything? Um, and I, I touched on that a little bit. I, I, I didn't want to go into that in too much depth. Um, but for those of you who are interested in that question, uh, comparing and contrasting the Tolkien's concept of Artemard with uh, the Christian doctrine of original sin and the fall of Adam and Eve, you're in luck because Tolkien talks about this. In the draft letter of 1958 cited above in reference to the death of Muriel, remember that's the one in which uh, that we looked at at the end of last week, the one where he, Tolkien, suggests that Muriel wanted to die. Um and then Christopher was saying that that was a dark saying, and I was arguing that I don't think it's quite as dark as Christopher was suggesting that it was. That 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 letter, same letter, right? In that same letter, um, uh, Tolkien continues. I suppose a difference between this myth and what may perhaps be called Christian mythology is this. In the latter, the fall of man is subsequent to and a consequence though not a necessary consequence, of the fall of angels, a rebellion of created free will at a higher level than man. But it is not clearly held, and in many versions is not held at all, that this affected the world in its nature. Evil was brought in from outside by Satan. In this myth, the rebellion that is in his own myth, the rebellion of created free will precedes the creation of the world, Ea. Ea has in it sub-creatively introduced evil, rebellious, discordant elements of its own nature already when the let it be was spoken. The fall or corruption, therefore, of all things in it and all inhabitants of it was a possibility, if not inevitable. Okay, so you follow that? Basically, he says the, the number one difference is the relationship between the fall and reality. Basically, and uh, what the, the 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 difference the the relation between that and creation. So, in the Christian tradition, the world is created perfect. When God creates the world, there is no evil in it, but there is free will, right? Um, and the free will of creatures, through the free through their free will, created beings can introduce evil into the perfect world, and that's what happens on two levels. First. Satan falls. But Satan's fall is after the creation of the world. The world has already happened, and then Satan falls. So again, Satan brings evil into the world. But it wasn't there already. The world itself was perfect. And then he, through his own evil choices, Satan's, that is, acts upon Adam and Eve. And then through their choices, evil is further brought into the world. And traditionally, within the Christian tradi- within the Western Christian tradition, I should say, uh, it is... Um, uh, it, it's understood that the fall of Adam and Eve is then what changes the substance of the world. So, like, the inclination to evil, the concept of original sin emerges from, it's called the sin of Adam and emerges from Adam and Eve. But again, it was not part of the original picture of the world. It is a subsequent event to creation. Both of them. Both the fall of Satan and then, afterwards, the fall of Adam and Eve. And though he doesn't emphasize that in this passage, it's the latter of the two that's like the big deal. It is the fall of Adam, not the fall of Satan. It's the fall of Adam that really changes the fabric of the world, basically. In Tolkien's myth, so when he's trying to explain what is the essential difference between his myth and the idea of original sin uh, and the fall of man in Christian tradition, 
The essential difference is that the marring of Arda predates creation. When creation happens, when Ea is uttered, right? When, when Iluvatar says, let it be, the, the world that he brings into being is marred, subcreatively marred, introduced subcreatively, not subsequently, right? Not imported into an otherwise perfect world, but programmed into the fabric of the world subcreatively as it is brought into being. That is um, the difference between Tolkien's mythology and the Christian and the general Christian tradition. So he's, he's not saying... I mean, one, one really, really simple conclusion that we should make sure that we state explicitly uh, before I move on from it is Tolkien is here openly acknowledging he's not trying to do the same thing. His mythology is not this. He's not following. So if you're looking at the two of them and saying, hey, these look really similar. So this is Tolkien's way of depicting the fall of Adam or, you know, the fall of man. Yes and no. Not exactly. Right. He is not claiming that they're the same. His mythology differs from the Christian mythology in this way. Um, and he's quite open and explicit about that, um, which I think is a really important thing to observe here. Um but anyway, to then move on to the, the, the sort of further conclusions that I, was, that I had already begun to draw. Um, this has a profound effect in two different ways, I would say. I, I would point to two things that make it a very different, make Tolkien's story a very different story from the story of the fall of man in Christian tradition. One is that, again, there is the idea of Arda unmarred. The emphasis on hope or faith, hope is the word that Tolkien tends to use, but he's using it in a very similar, I mean, it's very closely tied to the concept of faith. The hope that the, the children of Iluvatar are enjoined to have, enjoined by, by Manwe and by Mandos at the end of that debate. The hope that they're supposed to have, the hope in Arda unmarred, Arda as it should be, right, is... Theoretical is not something anyone has ever seen. I mean, there's a sense in which Manway might perhaps remember, like, the original vision of the music that was laid out before them. Um, you know, he didn't see the whole thing, but he knows bits of it, right? And so, you know, he can kind of get a, a sense of what Arda Unmarred might have looked like, but it's never existed. No one's ever, seen, there's never been a perfect world that then fell. That's not Tolkien's story. Tolkien's story is that on a sub-creative level, evil was introduced into the fabric of the world. And so there is a much more... The importance of that hope is therefore increased, but I would say the level of difficulty is also increased, right? Um... There's not a. We, Tolkien does not depict a world that is pining for restoration. He does not depict, you know, a, a world which has a broken bone that needs to be set, right? Or like a dislocated shoulder, which once it gets popped into the joint, you'll be like, oh, yeah, that's much better, right? That's not the world. That's not Tolkien's world. Tolkien's world is corrupt from the ground up, from the very foundation. No one has ever seen Arda unmarred. They can only speculate. I mean, they can use their brains, right? They, they, can't, they don't have to guess what Arda unmarred would look like, but nobody, not even the Valar, have ever seen it. That's a really, really important difference. The second really important difference is who's the main character? Of the story. In the Christian Fall of Man story, Adam and Eve, right? Adam's the main character. It's that is it's the humans. It's not the sin of Satan. It's not the sin of Satan that changes the world. It's the sin of Adam that changes the world. Right? In Tolkien's story, Morgoth is the story. Right? It is Morgoth and primarily Morgoth, right? The what gets done, it's not to say that the individual choices of the children of Iluvatar don't matter, because they absolutely do. 
but they're not the thing that changes the story. They are merely enacting the story. Notice what he emphasized there at the end. The fall or corruption, therefore, of all things in it, that is, of all things in Artemard and all inhabitants of it, was a possibility, if not inevitable. There is a possibility that any inhabitant in Arda is going to fall. They all have a natural inclination to fall, a natural inclination towards evil and perversion. Uh, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm looking at like as if it's on this slide when it was on the previous slide. Inclination to evil and to perversion from their right forms and courses. Yes. Um, Tony just asked, including the Valar, which is what I was just thinking myself. You know, I don't know, Tony. I don't know if he would necessarily attribute to the Valar a perversion of their wills, necessarily. But they have been bound to Arda, right? I mean, they have entered into Arda. They are, like, they're part of the Arda system now. And I, you know, Tony, I can't think that they're not included. I have to think that the very fallibility, even folly at times, of the Valar, not just their cluelessness, but they, 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 not only do they lack information, but they just, they sometimes make the wrong choices. Um, they might not be as bad choices as some of the children do. I mean, it's not exactly, you know, sort of like Feanor or Maeglin level of bad choices for most of them. Though, again, we certainly have examples, right? I mean, Sauron and Saruman kind of come to mind of, uh, you know, folks in that category who... Um, um, uh, who, uh, who would say that? Um, but uh, but but yeah. I mean, I've I've got to think that um, there's um, there's uh, there are ways in which the Valar themselves, in as much as they are bound to Arda, have been corrupted by this as well. Now, see, Chris, that's exactly what I was afraid of. Um, uh, Chris just says, now you speak with the tongue of Morgoth. <laughs> exactly, right? That's exactly what our narrator from a couple of drafts back would have said. Remember when the, that, the narrator pops out with that totally unequivocal, uh, like there are those who say that the Valar were wrong, but they speak with the tongues of Morgoth. And it's like, whoa, okay. Um, I, um, I think that... Yeah, <laughs> basically, Chris, uh, I, I, I think that what we see here um, is Tolkien backing down from that stance. Um, you know, he had that impulse to, to, to sort of double down on the Valar and be like, no, 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 wait, no, no, the Valar have to be good, right? But as he's worked through it more, I'm not sure that that fits anymore. And I, I, I always felt that that moment, that that you speak with the tongues of Morgoth moment was kind of a blip. You know, in Tolkien's career, I mean, the Valar are pretty obviously fallible um, from the beginning of Tolkien's mythology in the Book of Lost Tales all the way to the end, except for that like one draft, right, in which uh, the narrator gets awful offended at the idea. And I get to me, that passage is really clearly the exception. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's the exception. And I'm not even sure exactly. I'm still not really sure what Tolkien was going for there. Does that reflect a moment where Tolkien was trying was like changing his mind right when he was like, oh, yeah, no, no, no. I've got to get rid of this whole like the whole, uh, you know, I'm going to I'm going to throw the idea of the fallibility of the Valar into the same dustbin that I threw, you know, like the um you know, the early like myth of explanation material and, you know, the 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 kind of some of the wacky choices and um, hijinks that the Valar got up to in the Book of Lost Tales. I, I know I'm going to put that all in the same, you know, in the same bin um, and just say, no, no, the Valar are like these perfect angelic beings. It's possible that he was really contemplating that at that point. That seems to me a very conceivable sort of moment for him to go through in the philosophical contemplations that he's doing. Um, there's a certain sense to that. There's a certain appeal uh, to that, I think. But I don't think if if he really had that conviction, I think it was short lived. Um, 
And I think it's also possible that he never really had that conviction, that instead what he was doing was emphasizing sort of the tension there, um, that it's possible, I think, that Tolkien intended his narrator to sound a little shrill there, you know, his narrator himself to protest too much, especially since, let's not forget, um, that was also from a time when the frame narration of the uh, uh, of the narrator was clearer, right, where we had um, Pengalov and, uh, and Alfwina speaking to each other more directly back then. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, all right, so that's what I wanted to emphasize this about this. Brian, you were asking, um, would the concept of, of sin be relevant or similar here? In some ways, Brian, I mean, I, again, he's comparing it to the fall of man. I do think that he is invoking the concept of original sin, right? That's why he comes back at the end to talking about how in his mythology, all the inhabitants of Arda, um, uh, for all the, the, the inhabitants of Arda, fall or corruption was a possibility, if not inevitable. He's, he's, he's alluding there to the concept of original sin, but you'll notice he doesn't use the word sin in this paragraph. And I think that's because it's, it's not the concept of sin itself, like sin as, you know, a, a, a choice or action which is in violation of the will of God, you know, that like sin as a measure of like the direct relationship between God and his creatures. That's not the issue. That's not the subject that he's talking about here. Right. He's not talking about like the decrees of God and the obedience of his creatures. Um, again, it's it's that's certainly related to these issues, but that's not what he's focusing on. What he's focusing on is the question of the fall in general and the concept of original sin and, and um, inherited fallibility and all that kind of thing. Um, so sort of yes and no, Brian, I guess would, would be my answer there. Um, okay. Here's the conclusion that Christopher comes to about the immortality of the elves after his um, summary of the death stuff and everything. The immortality of the elves, coextensive with the life of Arda, their deaths and rebirths, were deep laid and fundamental elements in my father's conception. At this time, he was subjecting these ideas to an elaborate analysis, and extending that analysis to the ideas of deathless Amon, and the significance of Melkor in the perversion of creation as it had been expounded by the Ainur, to the Ainur by Iluvatar in the beginning. This analysis is in part presented as a debate among the Valar themselves, in which they reach new perceptions concerning the nature of Arda, but the theoretical discussion of moral and natural laws is given an immediate dimension from its arising out of the strange story of the griefs of Finway and Muriel. That story was retained in the published Silmarillion, but with no intimation of its implications for the rulers of Arda and the lore masters of the Elves. I love it when Christopher gets all passive voice about the Silmarillion. That story was retained in the published Silmarillion. It's kind of retained itself. Anyway, sorry. In these writings is seen my father's preoccupation in the years following the publication of The Lord of the Rings with the philosophical aspects of the mythology and its systemization. Of the deliberations of the gods, the sages of the Eldar preserved a, a record among the books of their law. How far away from these grave doctors seems the horned moon that rode over Alfwina's ship off the coasts of the Lonely Isle as the long night of fairy held on. Alfwina is still present as communicator and commentator, but there have been great changes in Elfiness. Yes, absolutely there have. Um, and we, can, we have certainly been observing um, the... Uh, uh, the philosophical speculation. One of the words in this passage that was most interesting to me, I mean, most of these things in Christopher's conclusion are things that we've been seeing and talking about for a long time all the way through here. Um, one of the things that really struck me as interesting is his reference to the, the word I mispronounced, system, systemization. I can't pronounce it. I, th I guess when you take out the Z, it makes it, uh, since I'm an American, I can't pronounce it properly. But... Um, the reference to that, to systemization, uh, that that's one of the ways that Christopher characterizes the work that Tolkien was doing right now. It's not only um, 
preoccupation with philosophical aspects, right? He's not just going off on tangents. He's going off on tangents for a reason, right? And the reason that he's going off on tangents is to systematize things, right? To make the Silmarillion material not just into a set of myths, which can be merely evocative, as like the passage that he quotes there about the horned moon and the long night of fairy, right? The long night of fairy held on. What does that even mean, right? Um, that's a that's a really I, I think it's a really neat example that he gives from back in the Book of Lost Tales. What what I think is really neat about it is that it has a very to me a sort of Book of Lost Tales ish um, evocativeness, but lack of specificity, right? What exactly does that mean? What exactly is he referring to? We don't know. It's much more suggestive um, than it is descriptive. It's much more mythical than it is explanatory, right? This, of course, is the big shift we've been seeing. Uh, and, of course, we have here Christopher's confirmation um, that... Uh, that was really very prominent in Tolkien's mind at this time. Um, and personally, I think that that is what I can totally, even though, I mean, I've already been indulging in some uh, ill-humored complaints about Christopher's choices in publishing things in the, in the final Silmarillion, but I can't really fault him for the principle that he chose. The, pr the primary principle that he chose, as he explained before, was consistency, right? Trying to present this material in as consistent a story as possible without, and this is me adding, he didn't say this explicitly, but it's fairly demonstrable when we look at things, without his him having to write too much himself, right? Keeping as high a percentage of the text being text that J.R.R. Tolkien himself penned as possible, Right. Taking those two things, those two things seem clearly to have been the guiding principles of his uh, of, of his edition of the Silmarillion that he made. And I can't blame him for that, even though he said in those earlier passages that he sort of in retrospect regrets some of the choices that he made, that he th thinks he went too far in insisting on a total consistency. Um, I can understand it, because there he was reflecting his father's own desire, right? J.R.R. Tolkien wanted it to be consistent. He wanted to systematize it. He wanted the Silmarillion to be a world that you could invest secondary belief in. Something that held together and made sense and works as the historical backdrop to, pre prequel to, The Lord of the Rings, right? Um, it's a totally different kind of narrative. Um, and, you know, Christopher doesn't speak explicitly here of what we've been observing all the way through, right? This kind of war between, well, I don't want to say logic and myth, right? But between um, a certain kind of psychological realism, a certain kind of philosophical consistency, between systemization, perhaps, and myth, right? Um, and... But I think that we can nevertheless see that and see the direction. Now, again, we've seen many points at which Tolkien is clearly only willing to go so far. Right? He's not willing to just sacrifice myth entirely for the sake of uh, systemization. But um, but that's definitely the direction in which he's in which he's he's moving. Now, Stephen, wonderful point. Stephen says at this point is Tolkien still portraying this as a prehistory of our world or has he dropped that at this point? Um Stephen, I think that we can see some pretty clear evidence that he's dropped it. Um it it was something that was maintained as a sort of loose fiction. I mean, he still says that, you know, in the, uh, you know, in the in the prologue of the Lord of the Rings, right? And and certainly you've got the stuff that's still there in the Hobbit that says the same thing, um, you know, in some ways, Stephen, he he hasn't like officially changed that story yet, right? That's still the, you know, kind of official frame story, of the Lord of the Rings, but. As he's systematizing, we can see, I think, pretty clearly that um, 
he's not, I think it's pretty clear that he's not thinking in those directions anymore. I mean, goodness, just what we saw in the previous slide, right? Um, he believes in the fall of man, right? When he's describing our world, I, I don't, I do not take that passage from Tolkien's letter that we were just reading as any evidence that Tolkien disbelieves the Catholic doctrine of the fall of man. Um, I, I think Tolkien believes that, that that's how things are in our world. Um, his story is different from that, which is fine, of course. Like, he can be a lover of nature, not her slave, right? I mean, it's we know this is very, it's very much a part of his principles that he feels totally free to make a story, to make, a, you know, a story world, which is not exactly the same, doesn't operate by the same rules as our world. There's nothing that is like a challenge to his faith in that. But the the fact that he is drawing attention to those differences to me shows he's not he's not really trying to pretend. And again, honestly, I think that the the stuff in the framework of the Lord of the Rings that still kind of clings to that concept, I think is still by the time he publishes The Lord of the Rings, he knows pretty clearly it's not going to work. It's the kind of thing you could say in The Hobbit, and it's the kind of thing he could say when he set out to write the sequel to The Hobbit. Because The Hobbit story and the, um, you know, the long-expected party, etc. story uh, was an isolated fairy tale kind of thing. You know, so he could toss that off as a really fun kind of framing mechanism, right? And it was a fun framing mechanism. But... When you're going to marry the Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion, as he decides to do over the course of the writing, you can't have that anymore. Um, you can't have that. Um, and we already see him. Stephen, think back to what we saw in Sauron Defeated, right? Think back to the links between Numenor and, uh, you know, Gothic and Anglo-Saxon writings that we saw him playing with. Right during the Notion Club papers material and the later uh, fall of Numenor stuff, right? You know, this is not somebody who is who is just trying to imagine in the kind of way that he was imagining, the kind of, again, sort of loose mythic way that he was imagining this world to be the ancient prehistory of our world. Um, like, you know, with where Toleresia was England, right? Uh, with the island of uh, Ireland ripped out of it. Um, you know, dragged over uh, to be almost near the Great Lands, but not quite bordering them, right? Leaving the channel in between. Um, that, we're not there, right? As soon as he joins those two things, it's not possible anymore. Um, it's not possible to for the world to be the prehistory, for this world to be the prehistory of our world in that way. It's not, it just, it, it won't work now. Again, for the same reasons that he's got to change some of the things because of this systemization, I think. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. So, Stephen, I think it's pretty clear that that's um, uh, that that's gone out uh, pretty well here. Um, so, something else I was just about to say to that. Um, uh, Yeah. Um, right, Tomas, thank you. That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, it becomes quite silly to begin saying that this stuff is the prehistory of our world when it's by definition of the fact that we're reading these stories, not prehistory, right? Like, they, the, as Tomas, as you say, these people can write, right? What we're, I mean, how absurd is it to say, here's a copy of the Annals of Prehistoric Times, <laughs> right? You can't write Annals of Prehistoric Times, like kind of by definition. So again, he's, he's, he's out of that mentality now, um, especially since, again, he could, do, he could say that kind of thing. Back when he was, again, he could certainly say it in The Hobbit. He can certainly say it even in the Book of Lost Tales, right? Because there was a gap. There was a um, there was a divide there 
b- between the age of elves and the age of men. Numenor didn't exist in the Book of Lost Tales, right? So the elves faded and then the mortals came and they didn't really know about the elves and the elves are almost gone and have faded and um, and are only they linger in memories and, and glimpses that humans don't understand. And um, except there's this one book that survived, right? And that came in to tell the stories, but that wasn't fully understood and um, was lost and everything. So you could get away with, in that sense, saying it's prehistory in the sense of when men were prehistorical, right? When humans were prehistorical, all this elf stuff was going on, mostly unbeknownst to us. Um, But after post-Numenor, right? And when you now have, you know, the three ages clearly mapped out, in what sense? is this prehistorical now? You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it really begins to kind of lose itself. Uh, so yeah, so I, again, I, I think that it's, it's a concept that he is very much, um, leaving, but I think we can see him leaving it behind here, even though again, he hasn't forsworn it in print. It's still there in the prologue. Right. Um, you know, I, I, which is, which is fine. But again, I think, as he's systematizing things, as he's working stuff through, that's why he, uh, th- that's where I think we can see him leaving it behind. All right, let's move forward in the narrative. Um, one of the things we notice is another female character, him going out of his way um, to give us more information about a female character who played no part in the story in the very early days. Um, and even in the published Silmarillion doesn't get quite all of this text. Um, I'm pretty sure she doesn't pretty sure I didn't compare them paragraph by paragraph, but I'm pretty sure that this is a later version, even from the, pu- the published version while still in early youth, Feanor wedded Nerdenel, a maiden of the Noldor at which many wondered for she was not among the fairest of her people. But she was strong and free of mind and filled with the desire of knowledge. In her youth, she loved to wander far from the dwellings of the Noldor, either beside the long shores of the sea or in the hills. And thus she and Feanor had met and were companions in many journeys. Her father, Matan, was a great smith and among those of the Noldor most dear to the heart of Aule. Of Matan, Nerdenel learned much of crafts that women of the Noldor seldom used, the making of things of metal and stone. She made images, some of the Valar in their forms visible, and many others of men and women of the Eldar, and these were so like that their friends, if they knew not her art, would speak to them. But many things she wrought also of her own thought, in shapes strong and strange, but beautiful. She also was firm of will, but she was slower and more patient than Feanor, desiring to understand minds rather than to master them. When in company with others, she would often sit still, listening to their words and watching their gestures and the movements of their faces. Her mood she bequeathed in part to some of her sons, but not to all. Seven sons she bore to Feanor, and it is not recorded in the histories of old that any others of the Eldar had so many children. With her wisdom, at first, she restrained Feanor when the fire of his heart burned too hot, but his later deeds grieved her, and they became estranged. (laughs) Carita says, not among the fairest is a polite turn of phrase. Yes, it is, isn't it? Um, um, This is not only a female character, this is a very interesting female character. Right. Tolkien making a female. I mean, Tolkien is often accused of not only having few female characters, but having the female characters that he have be all up on a pedestal ish. Right. And certainly some of his female characters are like that. Um, But not all of them. Right. And Nerdanel is a fascinating example. Um, uh, Yeah. 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 all of the ways in like the, the 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 kinds of superlatives she's getting right um, are really really interesting. You know that Feanor fell in love with her not because she was the most beautiful of all of the Noldor. In fact, she's like not even you know she probably you know bottom quartile right. Because uh, I agree with you, Karita. That has all the um, stamp of understatement about it, doesn't it? Not among the fairest of her people. Um, he falls in love with her for her strength and her freeness of mind 
and her desire for knowledge. Um, and the ways in which her, um, the ways in which her strength even sort of exceeds Feanor's, right? She's more patient than Feanor. Um, also firm of will, but more patient. Um, this is, um, anyway, I, just, I think this is very, um, very interesting. Very interesting. And I have a very hard time thinking that this is not deliberate. That as Tolkien is going through and developing these stories into a different kind of narrative, away from the kind of cursory annals type, right? You know, the sort of uh, uh, really vague overview plot summary model. And he's beginning to get into the characters more. He's developing, beginning to really to flesh out these stories a little bit more. Um, tell more you know, down close to the ground, continuous narrative. Uh, one of the things that I think is, it is clearly visible is he is adding female characters and he is beefing up the female characters, the new ones that he adds and the old ones that were already there. Um, again, he hasn't said explicitly, Christopher hasn't said explicitly that he, you know, realized there needed to be way more women and is, uh, is correcting that fault. But, but again, I think, you know, whether or not he felt like, oh, man, I've got to go back and add more women, um, you know, whether or not that I that thought ever crossed his mind. What does seem clear is that as the narrative is shifting. That happened, right? Um, he focused on, you know, the fathers and the brothers when he was doing the, you know, over genealogical overviews. Right. And the the very brief summaries of, you know, the deeds of these families and stuff. He primarily emphasized the male characters. But now, as he's getting into the stories a little bit more, as he's fleshing this out, we get more women. Um, and Karina, I agree. In Nerdinelle's case, literally beefed up. Uh, as I agree, I think that she's completely ripped. I think that Nerdinelle, uh, she was strong, Clearly, not only in mind, right? Nerdinel clearly uh, would take could take you down, right? I mean, she, uh, uh, I think, has to be. We're not told that she is like the bulkiest, uh, you know, the most muscular uh, of elvish women. But I, I, you know, I would put my money on Nerdinel in a bar fight for sure, Karita. No question. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Brian says there's a dearth of female characters in the Silmarillion because many of them were smarter than their husbands and had enough sense not to leave Valinor. Yeah, well, that's exactly, Brian, one of the ways in which he's kind of spinning things, right? Um, I mean, that's, that, that is one of the consequences that we're getting here. Many of these female characters, Nerd and Nell, of course, very explicitly, um, but even things like Fingolf and Sister, you know, um, uh, are who are, they're, they're, they're not leaving, right? They are, in fact, making better choices from the beginning, really. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, I agree, Karina. There's a lot to love about this Nardanelle character. Right? As Karina says, she's artistic and smart and weird and had biceps. Uh, you know, And she dumps Feanor, right? I mean, I, she's the full package. I agree. I agree. I think this is, a, this is, this is an excellent character. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and again, very unlike, uh, certainly very unlike the kind of Tolkien female character stereotypes or even, you know, I would say um, caricatures that people often kind of uh, depict or, or sort of represent people who complain about female characters in Tolkien. Not without justice. I, I'm not saying there's no justice to that complaint. Um, but uh, but again, nerd and hell, talk about not fitting that mold, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Tony calls her another anti-Luthian. Yeah, in a sense, in a sense. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Moving forward in the narrative here. The unrest of the Noldor was not indeed hidden from the Valar, but its seed had been sown in the dark. And therefore, since Feanor first spoke openly against the Valar, they deemed that he was the mover of discontent. 
being eminent in self-will and arrogance, though all the Noldor had become proud. It was, maybe, the nature of the children, that as they grew, they should become willful, and should desire to escape from tutelage, remembering it with little gratitude. <laughs> oh, man. So, basically, you're saying the children of Iluvatar ha are becoming teenagers, right? Okay. Therefore, Manwe was grieved, but he watched and said no word. The Valar had brought the Eldar to their land freely, to dwell or to depart, and though they might judge departure to be folly, it would not be lawful to restrain them from it, if wise counsel did not suffice. But now the deeds of Feanor could not be passed over. And the Valar were wroth and dismayed also, perceiving that more was at work than the willfulness of youth. Therefore, Manwe summoned Feanor to appear before the Valar to answer for all his words and deeds, and he was brought to the gates of Valmar. Thither also were summoned all others who had any part in the matter, or any knowledge thereof, or any grievance of their own to declare. Um, so, uh, this is... Um, very like the passage in the published Silmarillion, but this again is a later version than the one that Christopher chose for the published Silmarillion. Uh, and it contains several sentences that weren't there in the original. Now, even if you don't have the published Silmarillion committed to memory, uh, guess. Guess the bits that aren't there. Anything jump out at you that seems based on everything that we've been seeing so far that you would think, well, that's probably not in the published Silmarillion, right? Um, do you hear the bits that kind of bits which really are sort of from this time, right? Part of this systematizing impulse uh, that Tolkien is going through here in which he didn't finish and so Christopher didn't choose to include... Exactly, Tony. That sentence about it was maybe the nature of the children, right? I mean, there you go, right? That's that's a giveaway right there. Philosophizing, right? Let's think about how it works for the children in general, right? Um, and although, again, yes, we can say the children of Iluvatar are going through this uh, awkward adolescent period, um, but remember, this is part. Remember the whole business about the Froa and the Fea and how the relationship among them. I mean, they're gonna, they're, they're, you know, it's perfectly natural for Eldar to go through changes at this time of their lives, you know. Um, I, but seriously, like the 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 way that the 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 Froa and the Fea relate means like there's going to be some awkward patches, you know, and uh, and the Valar understand that. But again. Boy, how far from that was how far was that from the mindset that Tolkien was writing in when he was writing the Book of Lost Tales or even the 1937 Quintus Silmarillion, right? He just he was not here at all. And we can see that um, uh, we can think uh, we can see all that stuff uh, kind of coming through, even again in that second paragraph. Um, uh Perceiving that more was at work than the willfulness of youth, right? Um, again, he has thought through things more. He has, he has, and also more attention to detail. Thither also were summoned all others who had any part in the matter or any knowledge thereof or any grievance of their own to declare. If you remember the published Silmarillion, the, the, the parallel passage that Christopher chose, which was from a couple drafts earlier, was just much more vague. It was like, and when it became known to the Valar, right? Um, uh, th you know, that that's it. There's n Notice how in that last sentence, we don't hear the councils and the debates and the cross-examinations and them really, you know, the, 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 the Valar themselves really kind of rolling up their sleeves and interviewing people and getting at the heart of the matter and piecing together what was going on. That is the real on the ground narrative, right? We don't get any glimpse of that in the old version, just a, a, a much higher altitude statement about how things became known to the Valar, right? Here we see those glimpses, right? So those two things, that impulse towards a more, um, is, I'm gonna use this word imprecisely, but I think you'll know what I mean, a sort of novelistic approach to storytelling, um, compared to the kind of anal-like um, epitomizing 
uh, top-down historical overview approach, um, more mythic, more historical, more distant view that he had before. So we see both of the, that shift plus the shift towards systemization. Uh, so that's, uh, I, I think we see both of these things creeping in here. Um, and again, notice that same sort of thing here. Um, here's Christopher talking about this phenomenon in his notes. Explanations in such a world uh, that is when you if you if you once you start making. So when he's talking about in such a world, he means the mythic world from before, um, thinking back to the old versions of the stories. Explanations in such a world may prompt unneeded reflections. The passage of Orame on his horse Nahar from Amman to Middle Earth is never described, nor, I would say, need it be, nor should it be. The movements of the great Valar, and indeed of the lesser divine, as Melian, are a mystery that we do not seek to penetrate. They are from beyond Arda and do not derive from it. To translate this into the vocabulary that I often use when I'm interpreting works and talking about this, and that, that you know, vocabulary I've used for years, um, I would paraphrase Christopher by saying, the old stories, we're not interested in those questions, right? If you are asking, if you read the old stories about how Orame is coming and going between Middle-earth and Valinor, and you as a reader are saying, yeah, but how? How does, does he gallop across the surface of the water? Does he teleport? How does it work? I mean, look, it's a free country, right? You can be interested in that if you want to be interested in that, but the story isn't interested in that. Ask it however often you want to ask it. It's not going to tell you Right. The story does not reward interest in that. And in as much as you are pursuing questions like that, you're not following the lead of the text. You're deviating from the lead of the text. You're kind of ignoring the lead of the text. You're not playing along with the kind of story that it's you're not listening to the kind of story it's telling. You're just kind of wishing it were telling a different story. Right. Um, so the point. So Christopher is talking about how now the new kinds of stories are interested in telling a different kind of story, right? Um, so, but he goes on. In the very old story of the transportation of the three original Elvish ambassadors from Quivian into Valinor, we might wonder with more right, perhaps, how they journeyed. For the elves, whatever their powers, are children of Earth and must live and move in the physical world of Arda. My father never said any more about that. And we may suppose, if we will, that they passed over the grinding ice borne upon Nahar, but that he perceived a need to respond at a certain level to speculation of this kind is apparent from this story of Orame's bringing to the Eldar a great store of weapons made in Valinor, for the store must have been great to be useful in the protection of such a host. So this is when he's talking about the Noldor making weapons, right? Um, uh, and how, so there's, you know, in this one brief version where he's saying that, because... Uh, he basically kind of paints himself into a corner, right? He's like, okay, so the old story is that they make weapons for the first time, right? Um, like the Noldor. When the Noldor make weapons, these are the first weapons they've ever made. And, but now he's like, well, hang on a second. That doesn't make sense, right? He didn't say, very, very rarely did he say, or at least not in this way, did he say, wait, that doesn't make sense. Now he's like, but wait a second, they can't just be making weapons for the first time. They must have had weapons before. When they were crossing Middle-earth, it had to be dangerous, right? They had to defend themselves from, like, monsters and stuff occasionally or whatever. So, so surely they had weapons back in the day. What happened to those weapons? And so, okay, so this means that, like, Orame must have brought weapons to them because they didn't know how to make them or they'd still know, right? They wouldn't be being taught for the first time. So they would have had to... If they're only just now learning weapons, then earlier they must have been given weapons by the Valar. How were they given weapons? Orame must have brought them over in like a bag of holding or something. I'm not really sure. But anyway, he like hauled like a... Orame now is riding across with Nahar with a big like Santa Claus bag over his shoulder full of weapons, right? That he comes and he distributes. Hey, everybody, okay, don't forget to return your weapons when you get to Valinor, right? You know, this is only a loan, right? You have to... to then there's a security deposit, right? I mean... This is like the way that he's thinking through the story now. So again, the, the, the major point that Christopher is making here is, again, 
you can see how differently Tolkien's mind is working now. This is not an, the, the point is, this was not an, even on the horizon before. This was not the kind of question that the text was interested in at all, right? Um, how did they get weapons? Who knows? Who cares? Did they have weapons? Who knows? Who cares? Doesn't matter. Do we have any stories of them fighting anybody as they travel? No. So let's not worry about it, right? But now we're worrying about it. Now he's not just myth making, now he's world building. This is a fundamentally different kind of activity. And so you can even see how it's changed. Remember the, the business about Nahar and the weapons and transport of the ambassadors and stuff? I got to think, if now, in 1958, Tolkien were rewriting again that early material, I bet you he would be thinking about this now. I bet he'd be like, oh, wait, but how do they get the Valinor? Right? I got to explain how they were physically transported to Valinor from Quivianen, right? Whereas even as recently as like the beginning of the, of the later Quenta or of the Annals, he wasn't answering that question yet. He wasn't asking that question yet. Now, now he is. Now I think he would if he went back and started it all over again right now. Um, and again, that's, I think, why Christopher doesn't include the later stuff that is doing that because it brings up all these questions that Tolkien never answered uh, in other places. Um, so again, this is just another way to kind of wrap our minds around how Tolkien's approach to storytelling is really shifting as he's writing through. But now let's dig into some narrative. Let's, let's look at some later versions of these stories that we've already seen. So we're going to be looking at the stories of Ungoliant, especially. I love the Ungoliant bits here. Um, and let's uh, think about the published Silmarillion. Remember that the published Silmarillion version of the Darkening of Valinor is drawn almost completely from the Annals. We've already read it. The last version of the story that we read when we were looking at the Annals of Amon, that's the version. And you'll remember when we were talking about that, that's where his like narrative flow was totally getting out of hand, right? Remember when he, he sort of starts off doing an anal mode, but then it becomes this like full uh, uh, narrative with dialogue and, um, uh, you know, dramatic transitions and stuff. It's not an anal entry at all anymore. And we talked about how his story was kind of carrying him away during this, that very section, right? Now he's returned to that section. And we get all this more stuff, which we don't get in the published Silmarillion. Thus unseen, so we get all this different stuff about Melkor's movements. Thus unseen, he came at last to the region that once was called Avatar, beneath the eastern feet of the Pelori. A narrow land it had become, eaten away by the sea, and was long forsaken. There the shadows were deepest and thickest in the world. In Avatar, secret and unknown, save to Melkor, dwelt Ungoliante, and she had taken spider's form, and was a weaver of dark webs. It is not known whence she came, though among the Eldar it was said that in ages long before she had descended from the darkness that lies about Arda, when Melkor first looked down in envy upon the light in the kingdom of Manwe. But she had disowned her master, desiring to be mistress of her own lust, taking all things to herself to feed her emptiness." To the south she had fled, and so had escaped the assaults of the Valar and the hunters of Orome, for their vigilance had ever been to the north, and the south was long unheeded. Thence she had crept towards the light of the blessed realm, for she hungered for light and hated it. In a ravine she lived, and wove her black webs in a cleft of the mountains. All light she sucked up, and spun it forth in dark nets of gloom. But now she was famished, and in great torment, for all living things had fled far away, and her own webs shut out from her all light that could come to her dwelling, whether through passes in the walls of Amman or from the heavens above. Yet she had no longer the strength or will to depart. What do you notice about this description of Ungoliant? This is an amazing passage, and in a couple ways, very much unlike We've, we've known Ungoliant for a long time, right? Ungueliante has been there from the very beginning, right? She is a Book of Lost Tales creature. Who was she? Remember who she was in the Book of Lost Tales? 
Anybody remember good old Ungueliante from way back when? What what was she like? What did she do? You know, what what was Un Ungueliante's uh, uh, idea of a good time? Anybody remember? What was her most famous um, act? A story that never really got told, except in a version of the uh, Arendel poem, the one that Bilbo almost sang in Rivendell before he revised it again. Exactly, Josiah. She tried to eat the sun. She caught the sun and moon in her webs. And then Arendel has to go down and kill her and rescue the sun. Yeah. Different world. Different world. She's also a free agent. Um, she is one of the clearest, in fact, really the clearest in the Book of Lost Tales world. Um, the clearest, uh, like, uh, you know, demiurge of evil, basically. She is the embodiment of darkness, of shadows, the gloom weaver. Um, she's depicted as a, a, you know, she was there from the beginning. Melkor was great and fell. You know, there are other Valar who are kind of sketchy, right? Like the short-lived, I'm forgetting his name, began with an M. I'm not going to get it wrong if I try to guess it. Remember the guy who had the gladiatorial arena of Valinor? Um, the guy who was... Uh, uh, was resp Makar, thank you, Tony and Josiah. Yes, Makar and Mayase, uh, his spouse, who are all about violence and bloodshed. Not friendly violence in the Tolkien sense, right? But like blood sport violence. Um, uh, yeah, so that was, there, there were Valar of those, and they were like really sketchy, morally speaking. But even they seem clearly to be, like Melkor, a corrupted ideal, right? Like they they were, they seem to be corrupted rather than, you know, representing an originally kind of dark or evil impulse. But there was Ungueliante, right? She's just darkness, straight up, you know, opposed to light, opposed to goodness. Um, an original archon of evil in the Book of Austell, as far as we can tell, Right. Well, that's changed now, right? But it's not just that. It's not only her origin. Notice she's been systematized now, right? She must have been a servant of Melkor originally. She must logically have been one of those who followed Melkor originally in the Discord during the song, right? During the music. Um, so she's kind of semi-officially one of his Maya, one of his Maya now. Right? Kind of? Sort of? Um, uh, I mean, she's, you know, she's a pretty big deal. But she called him master, right? Uh, you know, before. Before she set out on her own. Um, and... But there's... But there's more, right? To the south she fled, and so it escaped the assaults of the Valar, What's it like for her in the south? In a ravine she lived, and wove her black webs in a cleft of the mountains. All light she sucked up and spun it forth in dark nets of gloom. Well, when I say all light, I mean all light that got to her, into her little cleft of the mountains. Not like all light in the sense of the sun and moon, right? She's, notice how scaled down she is, right? She's not laying snares for the sun anymore. She's just catching, like, deer and, like, marmosets or whatever else they have there, right? For all living things had fled far away, and her own webs shut out from her all light that could come to her dwelling, whether through the passes in the walls of Amon or from the heavens above. Yet she had no longer the will or strength to depart. So she's not just been scaled down. Right? This is not just like Tolkien nerfed Ungoliant, right? It's not just that. 
uh, gaming term for those of you who are not familiar with it. Don't worry about it. Uh, but um, it's not just that. He's not just toned her down. He's systematized her. Right. She fits now, not only in the sense that she was a follower of Melkor and uh, and so therefore presumably had, she also is a perversion as well. Right. She's been she's twisted in some way. Right. Like she just as like the Balrogs presumably had like a, a noble and upright role. Right. Before they fell. Um, so, too, Ungoliant must have had a, a good role, you know, in the mind of Iluvatar originally. Um, but. um We see her systematized in other ways now as well, right? The consequences to her are being thought through. She's being philosophically systematized as well, right? This nature of consuming light but hating light, hiding from light in shadows of her own making and yet desiring light and wanting to take it in, that's always been there, right? But Tolkien never thought through what that meant, Right, what that meant for her, her famishment. What's the noun form of that famish, fam famish famishment, famish famishitude fam, fam famine. Yeah, technically, I suppose. Yeah, we'll go with that. I kind of like famicity, Kimber. Um. Let's go with famine. Okay, fine. In her... How her famine is the result of her own power, right? The way in which she is made into, for the first time, explicitly, this almost perfect um, embodiment, personification, or arachnification of evil, right? Of the nature of evil. This is... Um, this is a new thing. It was always there. Like, it was always kind of latent, right? But again, he'd not been doing that kind of philosophical uh, working through it. Also, who does, who, does, who does she sound like? Remind you of anybody? In a ravine she lived and wove her black webs in a cleft of the mountains. The light she all white she sucked up and spun it forth in dark nets of gloom. Um... Uh, all living things had fled far away and her own web shut out from her all light that came into... Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's Shelob, right? And of course you remember that in a couple drafts of The Lord of the Rings, Shelob was ungoliant. Right. It was Ungoliant, I should say, that Sam Gamgee meets and fights in the cleft uh, of Kirith Ungol, right? Um, that was not just a fleeting idea that, I mean, it didn't last as long as Bingo or Trotter, but it, it was there, right? It was a, it was a fully developed idea uh, on his part. Um, Arthur, exactly, exactly. So Sam was to be Arendel to be a recapitulation of Arendel with the light, right? With the star glass. He's got the light of Arendel Silmaril in his hand, right? Absolutely. He was designed to be the new, shorter, more humble Arendel. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I cannot imagine, given the uh, explicitly, you know, Arendelian context of the star glass, right? That, uh, Tolkien was not thinking of that. Um, can't have been. Can't have been not thinking about that. Um, so he set out to depict, to write Ungoliant herself into The Lord of the Rings. Decided against it. Decided instead to make it an offspring of Ungoliant. Um, so he takes out Ungoliant and, and calls her Shelob instead. And now... After that, he comes back to depicting Ungoliant, and lo and behold, she looks exactly like Sam Gamgee might have fought her, right? Except it's Melkor coming to find her instead of Sam Gamgee, right? Um, with, of course, needless to say, different motivations. But um, that's really, uh, uh, I think that's really, really fascinating to see. So we see, So again, you notice how 
his whole approach to Ungoliant is different on several different levels, right? She fits theologically within the new theological, the newly consistent theological framework that he's established for the Silmarillion myths first. Secondly, she fits within the scope and scale of these stories now, right? She's not, she's not laying traps for the sun, right? Um, she's, uh, she is sucking up light, but she's also eating creatures. And, and she is now being made into a, like, she could be a character in a novel, right? She could be a character in a, uh, in, in a, a historical romance like the Lord of the Rings. She did, she got cut from the Lord of the Rings, but this is like the Ungoliant from the cutting room floor of the two towers brought into the Silmarillion, essentially, right? Um, and that's really interesting. Again, so in several different dimensions, you could say, oh, and then, of course, the whole way that she explicitly illustrates the philosophy of, like, the nature of evil, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, all that stuff shows is a really cool example of the new kind of story, the different kind of story that he's writing now. Melkor first interacting with her. Come forth, he said. Thrice fool, to leave me first, to dwell here languishing within reach of feasts untold, and now to shun me, giver of gifts, thy only hope. Come forth and see. I have brought thee an earnest of greater bounty to follow. But Angoliante made no answer and retreated deeper into the cloven rock. Then Melkor was angered, for he was in haste, having reckoned his times to a nicety. Come out, he cried. I have need of thee, and will not be denied. Either thou wilt serve me, or I will bury thee here under black stone thou shalt, and under black stone thou shalt wither into naught. Then suddenly he held up his hands, held up in his hands two shining gems. They were green. And in that lightless place, they reflected the dreadful light of his eyes, as if some ravening beast had come hunting there. Thus the great thief set his lure for the lesser. Slowly Ungoliante came forth, but as she drew near, Melkor withheld the lure. Nay, nay, he said, I do not bring thee these elvish sweets in love or in pity. They are to strengthen thee when thou hast agreed to do my bidding. What is your bidding, master? she said, and her eyes gloated upon the gems. Oh, man, this is a really, really... I mean, just this is such a different story. It's not just the mere fact that we get dialogue. It's not just the mere fact that we get ungoliant dialogue, which is pretty rare on the ground in the Silmarillion. Um, this is uh, the dynamics here are really interesting, right? Um, Josiah, absolutely. Josiah says, Anatar's master speaks. Yes, we see him manipulating, right? We don't get that much. We're told that Melkor manipulates the Noldor, right? But we don't see much of it. We don't get much of his dialogue, right? Um, this is really interesting. Um but again, a very different kind of story. Don't you kind of love... Doesn't it look like he's kind of doing a bit of a Gollum impression? Right? He's got the green glowing gems which make his eyes glow green in the light. So that, you know, the, the sort of the, um, the baleful green glow of his eyes in the darkness, which kind of makes me think of... Uh, you know, another glowy green eyed creature, uh, that we, um, that we know and love. Um, again, and just like the fact that there's even any kind of parallel there, right? Um, the fact that we're, it almost feels, almost feels like we're supposed to, almost supposed to make that connection, right? That there is something it's, it, it's not inappropriate for us to be remembering Gollum and the fall of Gollum and the ruin of Gollum and the temptation of Gollum in this temptation that uh, Milk, both seeing the path that Melkor himself is heading down and the, the way in which he's enticing um, Ungoliant. Um, it's, um, it's... Again, I don't want to go so far as to say this is a reference to Gollum. Like, you'd need to have read The Lord of the Rings first to understand it. 
but it's like I don't know maybe a step away from that but it's close to that closer than I would have expected certainly um, and uh, now Jocelyn okay so uh, Jocelyn is asking can he command her or is he bribing and conniving her he's doing all three actually commanding bribing and conniving her it's clear that he cannot just command her and she obeys automatically right she has her own will um, she, he starts off by calling her thrice a fool she left him she dwells here by herself and now she shuns him and, and is hiding from him when he comes. And that's that's you a fool three times over, Ungoliant, right? Um, so that is, uh, um, that's a really, we can see here, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, we can see here his, um, The characters are more dynamic than that. He is master, right? He claims mastery of her, but he doesn't, he can't just control her, right? Um, he has to. Um, uh, to try to work this stuff out. He has to figure out a way to make this happen. Um, he's limited. He has this authority. He claims this authority. Um, but he does, um, he does have to try to make a way to make it happen. Right. We, we see his limitations again. Think about not only how much, but, but literally how we're learning about these things, about him, about his character, about his limitations, right? All of these things. Um, this is not, that's not how the published Silmarillion works, you know? The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.